Today on Navigating Change, we bring you a conversation with Gloria Flores, co-founder and CEO of the Pluralistic Networks. Gloria shares with us a fundamental idea that the moods we find ourselves in, or the moods we fall into, effectively open or close possibility in our lives. In her book, Learning to Learn and the Navigation of Moods, Gloria builds off of 30 years of research on mood and brings a deeply relevant focus on how we can be effective in the workplace and in our personal lives. This conversation is a great opportunity for personal reflection in how we interact with our peers and engage in the work we do. We're thrilled to be able to introduce you to the work of Gloria Flores today. Flores, welcome to Navigating Change. I wonder if you could kick us off and, and give us some background. Where did this research come from? What inspired you to start looking at moods and the relationship of moods to acquiring new skills? I began to be very intrigued by what happens to people as they strive to learn something new. My background is a lawyer, but in the 90s, I went to work with a consulting company that was founded by Fernando Flores, who I am related to. Our niche was to work with people to enable them to do that work themselves. Our, our expertise was about how people work together to get things done. How we did that was in working with people to help them to learn, to communicate more effectively, to build trust with one another, with their suppliers, with their customers, to manage morale, to listen better. And about nine years ago, we had the idea that maybe we could teach those kinds of skills without necessarily having to be on site with a client working on a particular project with them, but we could use online virtual reality role-playing games as an environment to uh, have people engage and do certain missions that we assign and have to coordinate in that, we could help people develop the kinds of skills we had been doing for a long time. We offered a new course called Working Effectively in Small Teams. They all had different ambitions for signing up for the course. Some wanted to learn to work more collaboratively than not top down. Others wanted to learn to delegate. We knew that we, we could teach those skills. We knew how we could help people develop those skills. As we began to do that work, what I found fascinating was that even though people actively wanted to learn some things, like some people said, I want to learn to delegate better because I, I could work much more effectively and get a lot more done. Even though some people expressed a desire to learn that, something got in the way. They fell into a mood of a resignation about their ability to do that or other negative moods that kind of blocked them from doing what they needed to do to learn the kinds of skills that they explicitly said they wanted to learn. And I saw that over and over and over again. And that's what inspired me to continue to do that work and also to begin to write about it. Howard, talk to us a little bit about what inspired you to invest in moods. How did you come uh, upon this? I actually recently graduated from taking the West program. So it's a four-month program that Gloria leads with the team. It is as deep a dive of first recognizing the kinds of moods we fall into when we're trying to learn new skills, but also developing habits in having conversations with each other to learn about how you can recognize falling into certain moods and to recognize that I have more capacity than I thought I had to shift that mood. I remember the second session and, and Gloria's team's in the background. They're watching us work through these avatars. It's an amazing experience to be working with these artificial characters, which in some ways keeps it safe. As you know, Pete, much of my work is working and helping other teams. So this in itself was an, a, a really useful exercise for me to be part of a team needing to accomplish a certain set of objectives. And I learned so much from the four months of weekly practice. I'm curious from your perspective, when you think about helping people learn new skills, learning to learn, were you struck in in your own way about the challenge of getting people to actually slow down and learn this over time? 
when it comes to learning, we have a lot of stories about how we should learn and how things should be. Uh, no matter how much we want to learn something, we may derail ourselves because we may find ourselves in some mood that's not conducive to us learning and achieving our learning objectives. You know, people don't sign up to WES to learn about moods, but it ends up being a big part of what they learn, right? They, they, oftentimes they sign up because they are intrigued about learning to work more effectively in teams. They have some ambition about learning to work better with other people and to co-invent their life with others. That's what we see. And in, in our work, we say, you know, one of the guiding principles that's based on Fernando Flores' work that expands upon speech act theory work of John Searle and, and, uh, uh, and John Austin, that the basic premise there is that there is a finite set of conversational moves that all human beings make or can make when coordinating their commitments with other people, right? They, they can make requests. If something's missing or they need something, they assess they need something, they can make a request. They can ask for help. They can make promises, offers, right, to, to take care of something that the listener is concerned about. They can make assessments, and that's an act that they make to get in tune with what's going on around them, the situation that they find themselves in for the sake of addressing some concern that they have. Uh, they can make assertions, and, and they can make declarations to invent uh, a new world. Very simple, those finite sets of linguistic moves that people can make when they are coordinating and co-inventing their world with others. Sounds very simple, but what we find is that it's not so simple because even though people know and understand intellectually that they can make a request, you know, I can ask somebody for help, I'm stuck, I can say, hey, I don't know how, what to do, please come help me. Even though I know I can say that, what I've found is many times people don't avail themselves of that move that they can make for some reason. Instead, they fall into moods of confusion, into moods of resignation that's triggered by assessments like, you know, it's not okay to ask for help. I should figure it out my own, on my own. People are going to think I'm, you know, not smart if I say I don't know something. Uh, so they think that they should not ask for help. They don't delegate when they should delegate. Etc. So they, the same thing around assessments. Even though we make assessments all the time, people have all kinds of uh, standards that they hold themselves to. An assessment is not true or false. It's our evaluation about how something relates to some concern. It's not true or false, but it's grounded on... It's like a judgment, making a judgment. <laughs> It's a judgment that's based, but it's coming to us based on something we're concerned about. It's coming to, from our history, etc. An assertion is more of a fact, right? And oftentimes yeah. people confuse assessments with assertion. Not oftentimes, all the time we confuse assessments with assertions. And for example, if I say this is not possible, that's an assessment, right? But many of us, when we say that, we're we're living it like a fact without us even thinking automatically, because we're not thinking about those assessments, but those assessments show up in the moods that we are falling into, into. So if we say something, if we are in the mood of resignation, that's being triggered by assessments of that nature. So this is not possible. There's nothing else, else to be done. And, and when we look at those situations more closely, that may not be the case, but that's what we see in the moment. And the mood is already ahead of us. It's not like we're walking around making those assessments. We find ourselves in the mood of resignation. We find ourselves giving up uh, and we don't stop to pause to see, okay, what, what is that mood connected to? What are the assessments that might be triggering the, that mood? That maybe there's something that we can't do that we're just not seeing. I'm curious, when you find yourself around people who have practiced becoming aware of the differences between assessments and assertions in their speaking on teams, what do you notice shows up differently than teams that don't have that facility and having practiced it or skill? I'd say people who, who can make that distinction, that, that can distinguish between an assessment and an assertion on a much more regular basis, they see more possibilities. I see. Uh, because they don't say this is not possible. They begin to explore what is the assessment about? What, what's the concern behind the assessment? What's the experience behind 
you know, that assessment, right? We, we all have different experiences in life, right? different ways of seeing things. So when you are able to share an assessment, just like an assessment uh, that's connected to some concern and it's connected to some future that you want to bring about, because at the end, that's why we make assessments, right? We make assessments because we want to take care of something we care about, because we want to accomplish something. So the assessments that we're making are connected to that. Even though it's simple, I know I was never as aware as I am now that when I make an assessment, I'm making it one for the sake of something and it's towards something in the future. That's a that's a powerful, simple distinction. Pete, what strikes you about that? Most important to me is this whole idea of adaptability and recovery. And and what I've noticed in the you know month or so since we started talking about this this material uh, is that when I am more conscious of uh, these elements and elements of my mood that are defining the work that I do on a team and things that are forward thinking, as you're saying, these elements, when I'm, when I don't get mired in my mood, like ripples in a pond, uh, I'm able to recover fr- from frustrations and, and, uh, you know, anger and anxiety and things that plague me just like any other human organism. I'm able to become forward thinking again more quickly. I wonder, am I alone in this? Is this an element of the work and the research and the, your experience on teams uh, that is um, echoed? When people begin to become more aware of their moods and begin to see them not as things, not as things that just, just the way it is. I'm in, a, I'm in a mood of resignation and just, just the way it is. I'm frustrated. That's the way it is. And, right? Because we know that that uh, something can happen and we're no longer frustrated, right? So we are, even without us knowing anything about us, about mood, we're always a roller coaster of moods. Right? We enter into a meeting and someone is excited and showing us new possibilities. We're going to be ambitious. We're going to be in, in a more productive mood. We enter into a meeting where, where, uh, where others are resigned or there's a mood of distress. We're going to fall into. They're very contagious, right? So our contribution here is by translating moods as assessments of what we see possible. As human beings, we're always living in the present with concerns about the future. And we also live in the past. That gives us our habits, our values, et cetera. The past, it gives us how we see things. It colors, you know, how how we think things should be. And that may not be valid in the situation that we find ourselves in. But we're not reflecting about that. We're just just in a mood. By translating moods as assessments of, of what we see possible in a situation, then we can pause and explore those assessments. Right? And, and assessments are always connected to a future that we want to bring about, to some concern that we want to take care of. So by being able to do that, you can say, oh, I'm in a mood of resignation about the possibility of learning something new here, but I would like to achieve mastery or become an expert in this or, or just, you know, get to know, get to get a little bit more competent. But if, if we want to bring about that future, we want to learn a new skill then we need to be, learn to navigate that and see what is that assessment about? What are the standards that I'm holding myself to that may be not appropriate to the situation? And what actions can I take to continue to go forward in what I really want to invent here for myself, right? So, for example, in the book, I have one example that it's been repeated over and over again. You know, a, a person who was from a large organization and she wanted to learn to work better in teams. Um, she thought she was pretty good. She had 20 or so people reporting to her, but she worked really hard. She was always in a mood of overwhelm and working late and working on weekends, etc. And in the course, she was assigned to a team with five people. And there came to a moment where uh, the only move she could have made was to delegate or, or to ask for help and ask somebody to guide her and take over for, you know, she was trying to do something by herself. And she needed the help with somebody else. She never asked for help. She never, she's never said, hey, you know what? I don't know how to do that. Come over here and help me do it. Uh, she never did it. And, and as we explored after the fact, as when we debriefed the situation, I asked her, you know, hey, did you, you know, that, that move that you could make, a request for help or, a de- or to delegate, did you think of that as possible? And, and she said, you know, no. I mean, I, it crossed my mind, but I dismissed it right away. And she was so frustrated during the exercise. She kept apologizing for holding the team back. And, but she never asked for help. She kept trying to do it on her own. 
And as we explore that, she saw that she had the standard that she could not ask for help because people would see her as, as, as weak. She did not want to be the weakest link. And for her, asking for help was the equivalent of admitting that she was the weakest link and that others would assess her negatively. And when she began to see that by not asking for help, she led her team to not be able to complete the mission because they got stuck waiting for her the whole time. <laughs> uh, she, she began to see that that was not a standard that really was helpful for her to hold on to. And her mood of resignation about the possibility of working with a team and accomplishing the mission because she couldn't ask for help started to disappear. She became more confident about asking for help and ambitious about the possibility of actually working with a team and having people do things and not her be the only one doing things and, and having to stay late at work. Yeah. So in this case, she was able to see, it sounds like, that the cost of not asking for help created more of a breakdown. And then as a result, the team can be more effective by her giving herself permission to asking for help. Right. And in terms of the connections and moods, right, she, as we explore what happened in that moment, she observed herself in a mood of resignation about being able to be successful in this team. And when we, when we dug a little deeper, if she saw that, that she had the assessment and she couldn't get help, then they were going to fail. And so she resolved to begin to practice asking for help and requesting and delegating. And, you know, about six months later, she, she told me that she got a promotion at work, that she was doing way more than she was doing before, but not in the same way. Well, I'll tell you, Glory, that example is, is so great because if you have a team of five people or 10 people, every person has their own blind spot and their own blindness. And the, un the uncovering of distinguishing between assessments and assertions and moods as assessments about in the end, what we see as possible is so pervasive and in the background, I'm becoming more and more convinced that in the absence of people recognizing this, we can only go so far in being effective on a team. Whether you're, you're focusing on learning a new skill or just being effective on a team, and maybe that is learning a new skill, I found, Gloria, that people have an aversion to admitting that they're beginners or that they're not competent in a different in a certain skill. When it comes to working in teams, right, that even though that's not learning a particular skill necessarily, we're, we're, we're learning something new. We can be beginners all the time. You know, we, we, we come into a new team, we have a new role, we have a new client, new industry, etc. We're going to be in the midst of uncertainty and not knowing exactly what to do, not knowing what our colleagues' perspective are about something, what they, what they want to accomplish. So cultivating a predisposition to be open to learning, you know, learning whether it's something academic or being in a team with others at work, etc., having the disposition where uh, you can say, it's okay to not know and not have the assessment that that's a bad thing, right? When we're a beginner, we can have negative moods around learning and we can have positive moods around le learning. I, I think that there's so much room to offer this, what you've been doing through your program, but also in, in organizations to teach people how to step back and recognize mood as a foundational piece before we can focus on the actual work itself, that we have to develop a skill set in, in understanding how easily we get defensive, how easily, if I said to you, I don't, I don't think you did a good job, rather than you being interested in exploring with me, tell me more. Instead, what we often do is we get defensive. And that's such a pervasive behavior that shows up when we make assessments of each other. This is fascinating. And, and you know, as I want to know, I, I've got to bring this back to the classroom and this whole idea of the, the contagion of moods. I experience this in such real visceral terms every time I walk in front of a classroom. And the power that I have as an instructor to set the conditions for learning versus the condition for producing content. And, and that's a very different thing for a lot of people. If I come in and, and don't set the condition and the mood for learning, then I'll have people who just write papers for the experience of writing a paper and the grade. 
But if I do it right and accidentally stumble into just the right conditions for learning, the class as a whole will actually engage because they want to learn something, not just get the grade. I find that a fascinating uh, experience and, and the power that we all have, not just leaders of teams, but members of teams to set conditions for learning. I wonder if you could reflect just a little bit for me on on what those conditions look like. What are the what are some best practices in setting conditions for change, uh, for learning on teams to get people up and, and churned up and excited about doing good work? One of the key responsibilities, I think, for any leader, and, and, and I would say for any good teacher, right, is to be mindful of the moods of their team members and, and of their students, right? Because if there's a mood that's not conducive to working together, to achieving our objective, to learning, um, the, the likelihood of us accomplishing what we want to accomplish is a lot less, uh, maybe even non-existent. If you're working with a team that, that has fallen into a mood of, of, uh, of distrust or is resigned about the possibility of anything changing, uh, no matter what you do, uh, and, and with a, you come in with a new initiative and, and you know, that's that's a great idea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to have a hard time having people take action to collaborate with you and to do what you want them to do if they, if they have the assessment that there's nothing to be done and what's the point, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to address that in conversation to see how you can cult- cultivate a mood of ambition where they have the, an assessment that what's happening is actually good for them and, they, and, and the mood of ad- and ambitions and, re- and resolution begins to show up for them, right? The same thing for teachers, right? If teachers are working with a student who's fallen in a mood of confusion and when you explore that you you see that confusion is connected to an assessment that it's bad not to know and then not knowing they are stupid in in the book i talk about my experience with my kids i have three sons and you know there is one moment where my oldest when he was younger who has been a good student all his life has done really well is very good at math he came, I think it was third or fourth grade, where he had finally a, a problem that he didn't get right away. And it was a very emotional thing for him. He was completely frustrated by the fact that he couldn't get it right and that he didn't get it right away and that he wasn't smart. Because as I, I say, explore where that was coming from, that this one problem was causing such emotion for him, is that he had the interpretation that to be smart, you had to be fast. You had to get things fast. And he, and, and in this moment, he wasn't getting it fast, so therefore he was stupid and wanted to give up on the problem, didn't want to do the homework, decided that he was never going to study anything that required math in his life because that was something that he apparently was stupid at. Which, which I, it was, it was funny, but not because you could see how he was stuck in this mode that many of us get stuck at a certain point in our life and we never change. We're, we're, we're bad at math. We're stupid at math. We're resigned about the possibility of doing anything to do with math. And in that moment, I realized that luckily I was doing this work with adults that I needed to work with, with my child about his mood of resignation and insecurity about himself and began to have a conversation with him that shifted that mood to more of a mood of wonder and, and ambition. When we began to talk about that, I could see his mood shifting and not understanding actually became a good thing. He began to be more perplexed than confused. And by perplexed, I mean he knew he didn't understand it, but he was going to do what he needed to do to, to get it. And, and he knew that he could. So being mindful and aware of the moods that the people you're working with uh, ongoingly is very important. And if you see that there is a negative moods uh, in the background, then it's important to go and explore what are the assessments that they have that may be triggering those moods and engage them in conversations to help them to to cultivate something that's more conducive to uh, what people want to accomplish, either from a learning perspective or from working in a team perspective. Thinking about cultivating best mood experiences for for teams, you know, a lot of us work in online, uh, you know, virtual teams, and I know you have done uh, a significant amount of exploration in working with teams virtually. Can you talk about that? And I know, Howard, you've been involved in one of these teams. Uh, What does it take to build a, a great, um, you know, team experience that is conducive to learning, conducive to change, and and feeling empowered to change when you don't get a chance to see these to see your peers face to face. Yeah, uh, the the face to face. 
face aspect of it, you know, it's certainly nice when you can when you can see each other because you can detect, you know, inconsistency in in what's being said and 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 how they show up, right? I mean, someone can say that they're really committed and want to do it, but you can tell from their body language that they don't really mean it, right? So, uh, certainly being in person is. is you have that added dimension of, of, of seeing the person and following up on something that maybe doesn't appear quite right. But in virtual teams, you still have the ability to have conversations and to make commitments and to commit to shared purposes and, and to make assessments about how you're doing, what's working well, what's not working well. And I find that that simple act, which is, I, I know it sounds simple, but in practice, uh, m most of us have not been trained to engage in those conversations. In these virtual teams and these virtual programs, people find that they develop uh, very intimate, trusting relationships by the fact that they're engaging in conversations that they don't normally know how to have uh, before they do that. Right? They, they don't share um, uh, their assessments openly in a way and in a way that allows them to explore. They tend to hold back, but in the people who do these programs, once we, we encourage them to do that, to, to share their assessments, and again, assessments are connected to our concerns, are connected to our experiences, are connected to what we want to bring about. So by people being able to share those, engage in conversations about that, exploring them together, and then coming to some kind of agreement about what they want to co-invent together, what they want to do together, it develops intimacy and trust and, and a, a stronger team. I think the language piece of it is so much more critical when you don't have the ability to tie it to uh, people's expressions. Learning to listen and learning to speak more precisely is a skill that can be developed. And it's another example of it takes practice. What I'm learning is the power of listening to, am I being clear? Am I putting out to others that I'm working with declarations uh, that speak to a future that I want to produce? Am I conscious of that I'm making an assessment for the sake of something? These are things I never really was conscious of. So, so I think that it uh, it really it really be can benefit if you have the commitment to to being an effective team. Yeah, and you said something, Howard, that is very good. I mean, that. Communication really is about listening. It's not about what we say. It's about what we produce in the other <laughs> and how we listen to each other by focusing on the speed tax, right? That there's this finite set of linguistic moves we, we make, no matter where we're from, no matter what culture, no matter what country, that there's this finite set of moves that we make when we work together and we co-invent our world with other people. We make requests and we make offers. Nothing happens without a request and an offer a promise. No action is possible between two people. So you can be in a virtual environment listening for what's the request being made, what's the offer being made, you know, what's the assessment that led to that request being made, uh, what, are, what are the assessments that people have. And if you listen between assessment and assertion, you know that if it's an assessment that someone has some concern about that, that you can then begin to explore. Well, what is your assessment? Why do you say that? Tell me more for the sake of seeing what we may need to do as a team. And then if you develop sensibility around moods, right, or you can be checking in and asking questions to let you determine, you know, what is my team member's mood? What's the, team, what's the mood of the team? Where do we need to take action? What conversations are we not having that we may need to have to cultivate a mood of ambition, for example, that may be lacking? Or, or a mood of trust if we fall into distrust. So if you're looking for that and listening for that, then you can work you, know, you can work very well whether you're in person or or virtually. This is uh, just amazing uh, material here and I can tell you from the last just over the last couple of months that Howard has been making me aware of his experience here and in reading the book. I can already feel the difference in the way I communicate with others in particular teams groups that I'm involved in but individuals as well and I think that's uh, you know we talk so much about te the team piece uh, you know individual communication is is absolutely central here for for me and my work. This has been great stuff. You can have a t a, a team is just yeah. one plus. I, hey, I could just be talking to myself. Well, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> that, that could work. <laughs> That's why they want to ask. Many of the people that we work with, that I work with, oftentimes I know that they're um, becoming something that they're able to move with, and not just intellectually when they tell me, hey, you know what? I had a conversation with my son or with my spouse or with a friend where, you know, we were able to move something that we weren't able to do before, right? So when they, when they begin to, to bring it to not just their work team, but all the teams that they participate in. I have absolutely noticed a capacity to slow down and hear an assessment as an assessment and be willing at times to explore it. And that is a powerful skill uh, that, that I, my sense is it's a, it's a lifetime skill to keep developing. I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing and for my ability to participate in it. I know this is a topic that is a challenge for people and people call them difficult conversations and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we are already oriented to, to making assessments as something that's difficult for us. Instead, we're making assessments all the time, right? That people may, and we may not share them with each other, but we have them. What we don't know how to do well, and we haven't been taught how to do well, is to share them in a way that, that produces uh, new possibilities for us, right? And produces the kinds of results we want to produce. And when we make an assessment, really, it's revealing a lot more about us than oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes it reveal, reveals a lot more about us than it does about the person that we're giving the assessment to. That's right. It's, it's connected to our concerns, our way of thinking about how the world should be or what should happen based on our experiences, based on our professions, based on what we care about, and our values that we require throughout life. Right, all the shoulds that we acquire throughout the, throughout our lives. Now I have a way of looking at moods differently, not just being a hostage to them when I find myself in a negative mood. And we're going to find ourselves in negative moods all the time. That's part of being human. We can't control that. We're historical beings. We have a past that's going to color what we see possible. But we don't have to be prisoners of that. You know, when when we see that moods are, oh, these are just automatic assessments. Let me pause and explore those assessments. For the sake of seeing what I may need to do in and, and what kind of conversations I may need to have to accomplish what I want to accomplish, to learn what I want to learn, to not allow myself to get derailed, to build trust with this person, not get stuck in distrust. Before we go, what I want to do is give you a chance. If people are listening to this and they're saying, I want to learn more about what you're doing, your work, your book, wh where can we point people to? The company website is uh, uh, pluralistednetworks.com. They can also certainly read my my book that I just published, Learning to Learn and, and the Navigation of Moods. They can uh, find that on Amazon and or other, or Barnes & Noble, et cetera. Um, and we are... You know, our core course is working effectively in small teams. That's a four-month course. Uh, they can learn more about it on the website. Um, and we are scheduled to start one in late fall again. This is, as I anticipated, this has been eye-opening. Hearing it straight from the author, Howard Gloria Flores, thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.